Although J.B. Priestley was a Yorkshireman, passionately, he never came here on his English journey. In the springtime, very few people do, but I like the drive towards Pickering and Kirby Moorside in North Yorkshire, one of the lonely, empty places of our country. And here I stopped at a farm. The first thing you'll notice, I think, is the extremely rich colours. The grass is, is good quality grass and very bright green, especially after rain, when all the colours get intensified. Then the layer drops down and rises again to wonderful rolling purple moors. Undulating moor that you, looks like the sea. You look down on it from the green hills, and it's undulating like a sea that's not roughened by a wind. I'm fortunate having a friend who farms these moors, Philip Trevelyan, with whom I once made films. He was the director, I the writer. And one day after he got married, he bought this farm in an auction. Farmhouse of strong, thick walls and tiny windows, steep gables and a rough red roof, Every time you open the door, the view is spectacularly strong countryside. Beautiful, but strong winds on the morning I followed Philip round the farm. A few top fields of barley, some cattle and sheep, and Philip's mother staying to help with the lambing. Every year I, I come up in April for the lambing. It's one of the nicest and most exciting and dramatic months of my year because you never know what's going to happen. I mean, sometimes it's easy as anything. The sun shines and the lambs are born easily and, and they go straight out onto grass. And, but other times you get uh, the wind blowing from the northeast and the sleet and snow gets driven horizontally right across the top of the hill. And you may lose quite a lot of sheep up, in the, up on the moors. And these are Swaledale. They're all Swaledale, old Swaledale sheep that are producing these little lambs here. That one's lost. I'll find it. It is, isn't it? I'll find it. That one is what, last night? Yeah. It's all right, you'll be fine. He's just lost his mother temporarily. Mother will be feeding at the trough. You can still see the afterbirth on it, can't you? Bloody hell, it is little, isn't it? It's fine. Oh, they'll grow into something enormous for that. The little lambs are born damp and wet, and uh, Philip brings in the lambs, and you either put them in the lower oven of the arga, which gives them warmth and brings them to life in the most extraordinary way. They'll come in looking absolutely dead as mutton, in fact, quite limp and so on, and you, and you, you, you get a hot cloth and rub them like mad. And, and try and get their circulation going again. And in, sometimes in an, within an hour, they're clattering around the kitchen. And of course, if you get them to pee, you know they're all right. <laughs> Our fertility on a farm that's not a factory, but makes sound economics for Philip and his family. It's a proud achievement, as well as spring lamb and some top fields of best brewing barley, my friend's now taken up, I thought this was marvellous, a sort of bovine midwifery. It's called multiple suckling. Multiple suckling. And we do it, so we have ten cows in the field with twenty calves sucking at them. Uh, it's, a, it's a rare sight, but it works. They get their cows willing to suckle runts, bought in cheaply from the market, which are then nursed until fit and fat. Ah, fertility on the gable end of England. One thing helps the other. The, the pig muck helps the grass, and the grass feeds the sheep, and the sheep make the grass much closer sward. And the cows, well, one likes cows. We only uh, ten cows, so we give them names. There's Fat Betty, that's the big stout cow. She's named after a bit of stone on the moor up there. 
chat, Betty, and then there's uh, spectacles. We were a bit scientific when we started farming, you see. We thought we would name them after marks on them that we could recognise. So we call them spectacles and little specks and left patch and right patch. And uh, who else was there? It was an occasional bluebell. <laughs> but, uh, Blossom, Nelly's called that one Blossom, I can't think why. <laughs> That's not for yeah, scientific we're going down, reasons. No, we're going yeah. downhill slowly. Yes, you're, yes. It, romance is creeping in. It is, you know, it is, as we go on. Oh, the cream, there's another cow called Cream now. That's no good, is it? <laughs> Here I was on a sunny April morning, looking out on the sea of brown moor. Waiting for breakfast, mooching in another outhouse, I came on a rack of demonstration placards. What would happen if a megaton bomb dropped on York, said a placard? To animals, the water supply, radiation diseases carried by birds. What do farmers do to human refugees fleeing the horrors of York? Do you shoot them? Do you shoot them on a sunny April morning? Nellie was getting her children ready for school. I said, what are the posters for? Oh, that's our exhibition that we've done. That's the local peace group. We had to make an exhibition because we wanted to get our information across to libraries and we used it at the agricultural show. You can change put, it. Put it up at the agricultural show? Yes, we've had a, we always have a stand at the agricultural show. Peace stand? Mm. It's a big show. We only do it at the big show. Sorry, we people don't mind. Hmm? People don't mind. I mean, they don't. Actually, people take mighty little notice, but we think we'll have a bigger stand this year because they didn't take enough notice. You don't get ostracised for this. It's, um... Yes, I think... People think I'm pretty crazy around here because it's a very conservative area. And I think people do disapprove. We get people coming up to us in the streets saying, you better off going to the Russians and all that sort of do thing. Do you? Oh, yes. And while we crunched breakfast before the second slice could say hello to the marmalade, metallic chunks of NATO, harriers screamed across the roof, protecting Nelly's freedom from the Russians. Philip took me outside. You see those two ash trees there, with the moor behind it? You'll see them coming from right in the distance, right over the top of that bit of heather in the distance there. And you'll think, crikey, they're going to they're gonna come between those trees. And they very, very nearly do, just over the top of them. If you're standing on that roof, you're very not likely to be blown up if you happen to be there when they came over. But the next one never came. Not while I was there, though I heard enough on this gable end of England to know our island sounds defended. Surely that's the greatest change, that over little farms, over the red tile roofs and barns, there's a constant loud defence. Yet the sights and scares of war were common to Wordsworth. In Thomas Hardy's time, to Daniel Defoe, red soldiers on a patch of heath, a navy sloop in every bay, maybe... Only in J.B. Priestley's 1930s was there peace. Down a green dale and over a sweet hummock or two to pleasant Pickering, quintessential market town, picking up the journey Priestley made to the far north of England. Priestley was headed for the corner of the Geordies, passing through Harrogate, Ripon and Darlington in a chauffeur-driven car. But he stopped to have lunch, and so did I. I sat, Priestley grumbled, upstairs in a cafe and ate roast mutton and treacle pudding behind the Yorkshire post folded against the water jug. The waitress who attended me was tall, frail and looked tubercular. Well, my lunch in Pickering 1983 was venison and red currant jelly, delicious with French mineral water, in a room brought back to original Georgian space. Fresh linen, high ceilings, our waitresses were plump, roly-poly ladies with blossom cheeks and full of smiles. 
was not this country corner of England paradise itself. After you leave Pickering, you drive up onto a plateau. Wilderness, absolutely. These brown, soggy, purple in the season grouse moors. On the sign, you're entering a national park. In 1933, Priestley's journey, no wonder he didn't come to this bit. It was then a barely charted sheep track. Now it's a modern tarmac road, eloquently signposted, viewpointed, lay-by and picnic trailed. Clearly marked. National Trust, an area of outstanding beauty. And equally clearly marked is RAF Filingdales, for this is the way to the end of the world show. Is there any more important place in England than the ballistic missile early warning station for the whole United Kingdom, NATO and the Western world? As you approach, the road seems a plank across the high brown moor, heather resting on big thick clods of mushy black, black goo. And then you see them, gasp for breath, they're monumental elephantine, three white globes. Smooth but strange, like the Mekon's head. Chin up, I said to my chum for the day, Tracy. Think of Dan Dare and Digby. We turned off the road to the security lodge. With um, an appointment with Flight Lieutenant Lip King. Okay, then come look at the bonnet in the boot, please. Sure. Yeah. Have you any cameras at all? Well, the gate's up. In we go. If you will, print your name there and put your signature in there, please. Right. Give the quiet ladies. Those on one of those. We pin these. No, weather visible. Oh. Just take your first turn left to under the car park. The flight lieutenant King will see you from there. Oh, here he is. I can tell that's him. He's walking out in a jumper. <laughs> oh. Flight Lieutenant King. Hi, Bill King. How are you? Ray Gosling. Yeah, Don't... will you make sure the door's locked, please? Now, you have to leave your car up here because, again, even, uh, we can't even allow um, local cars down. It's going to be fitted with special suppression boxes inside. It's how delicate everything is. So, I'll send for a staff car now. Thank you. Thank you. Flight Lieutenant Bill King. He's station guide, responsible for taking parties round. Women's institutes, that sort of thing. Oh, Flight Lieutenant King, I want to go from 310 to 3, 302, please. When's your next transport? It's myself plus two. Five minutes. Thank you very much indeed. Bye. You have like a little bus service to you that goes. Little we have to because yeah. I say no, no unsuppressed cars are allowed near the thing. It starts, the radar actually starts picking them up and starts uh, activating. And it comes as a threat. That's, it's, it's so delicate that it really picks up everything and anything. They say the radar balls are so delicate they can pick up an object the size of a tea tray over Moscow. And I wonder when Andropov's kidney machine switches on at night. No wonder we have to have a suppressed boss. Goodness no, gracious, we're not getting in there, are we? No, we're not going to get yes, in Yes, we are. Oh, some are coming out. It's full of all those little wafts. <laughs> it's, it's, a, a it's, a, it's a crowd. It's a, it's a, it's a full bus. It's like a bag of load of monkeys in here. <laughs> a white minibus, chock-a-block with mostly wafts and one boffin with a spotty Robin Day bow tie. Over fenceless land of woolly mutton goes our suppressed boss until her head's a great door like the arse end of a Townsend Torreson ferry the giant doors to the outside slam behind us bye bye wilderness hello high tech <laughs> it's tied it's like the second Mersey tunnel Squadron leader shakes my hand. It's the RAF in charge, but what a lot of signs for RCA, Radio Corporation of America. Same outfit Elvis Presley sang Hound Dog for. Privatisation, privatisation. They do the wizardry at Filingdale. We're 
We walk up three fire escape metal flights of stairs. Push open a door and there it is. We're inside one of the balls and like a whopping circus tent there's this monster Jodrell Bank scanner. And we were warned to be prepared to move very quickly, just in case. Well, the, the radar is controlled from elsewhere, and it normally follows a, a set scan pattern. Um, and uh, provided it's following that set scan pattern, then we will always be behind it. But if it looks to me uh, as if it's doing anything unusual, then, as I say, I'll tell you when we'll come downstairs. The probability of that is, is extremely low, but obviously there's always the possibility of a malfunction. The radar waves of the giant scanner in the dome are very powerful stuff. The Daily Telegraph warned in April this year hang gliders not to fly too close to those ray domes, or I quote, their chances of fatherhood could be impaired. The biggest job is satellite spotting. All the bits of metal and a pair of astronauts gloves left up there. 4,891 bits they had to watch the afternoon we went. But as squadron leader David put it to us downstairs in the briefing theatre... Well, our primary function is, uh, if a missile attack takes place, is to raise an alarm and then send that, out that alarm to various uh, operational centres, both in the United States and in the United Kingdom. Once we have done that and the alarm has been sent out, our role is then complete. What happens to that alarm once we have raised it here is, uh, is out of our hands. Some people say, because we now have so much in satellites, Darling Girls is defunct. Rather not answer that. Uh, all right. How do you do the warning? Four minute warning, how does it happen? The four minute warning, um Really, any warning time that we give depends on where a missile was launched from and whereabouts it's going to impact. In other words, it's time of flight. It depends on the length of time it's in the air and when it is first seen by the radars here at Filingdales or at one of the other BMU sites. So really, a four-minute warning um, is rather meaningless. It depends on a lot of uh, variable factors as to how much warning the whole um, system would be able to give. But what do you do when you see something that is a missile? Time. The four minute warning does not. No. 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 no we're having trouble with words and uh, what can be said and can't be said. Do you have dress rehearsals? We have um, test tapes that we can feed targets uh, into the radars themselves. We have to obviously check out that the radars are working as we expect them to work and we can, can feed in test targets actually into the radars but the main computer knows that these are test targets and not real targets. I should hope it does but they have weekly rehearsals. Squadron leader David RAF led Tracy and me through more corridors to tactical ops room and oh Dr Strangelove this is what would happen how RAF Filingdales would play its part in the end of the world show. Launch an impact IRBM. There, up on the screen, we have one tracked at this stage. Confidence report now. Confidence report. Floor confidence. Oh, wow. The floor confidence is high, and the MIP confidence is high. The radar has gone out to track this, and at the present time, there's eight and a half minutes to the impact. Confidence is high. This is the Filingdales SDO to all centres. UK alarm level, UK alarm level, confidence high. A missile being tracked and we have a time to impact indicated. Carlingdale's SDO out. At a horseshoe desk sits the officer in charge, smoking a pipe in his RAF blue, like a young Trevor Howard. And a waff stands at his side, could be Julie Andrews. The time is now coming down, dropping 8.1 minutes to impact on the first missile. Now we're getting a build up of further tracks. Two being tracked now. Time coming down to 7.1 minutes. On the printer, you've got both the launch position and the impact position. Each time the bell rings, we get a change in the situation. All this information is sent back automatically to the stage. 
There's half a dozen others bouncing from chart to digitals, buttons, phones and dials and a tank of tropical fish. How thoughtful. Why are they watching a tank of tropical fish? One missile launch followed by a mass raid. And that is the state that we're going through at the moment, a mass raid. Quite a considerable number there now. And down the, the whole of the East Coast. Well, we got out. Confidence only so-so. I wonder, will one day our children's children romp on the ruins of this high techery? When all the watching's done from outer space, like in Star Wars, will boys and girls with rucksack and thermos clamber over rusty radar like so much old Meccano? More metal in Filingdale's than Blackpool Tower. Will it open up as an innocent Disneyland addition to a national park? If we live that long, if we survive. More atom bombs in England per square mile than any other country in the world. No wonder we need our filing dials. Across the road from the falls is a National Trust lay-by. It looks down into the thick forest of Gothland, where a steam train with a few uncomfortable coaches chugs through the forest on the private line of the North York's Moors Railway. What effort goes into restoring trains? What effort into searching for peace? Drive on, Tracy. We're getting Filingdale's balls in our heads. <laughs> More brown moors approaching us with their caged headlights on, a convoy of army trucks, Bedford khaki lorries with HGV learner plates, and overhead two harriers crossing the ruins of Whitby Abbey. There's a white police car, oh happy land, hello I want to wave after where we've been, police panda, how friendly, how normal you look. I turn on our little car wireless. Almighty God, giver of life and health, guide me, pray thee, with thy wisdom, all who are striving to save from injury and death the travellers on our roads. What an island. We turn left for Teesside, through Gisborough, on our left, the dark escarpment of the Cleveland Hills, on the right, the chemical Wilton ICI. It's a vast complex with a smell as if the biggest tomcat in the world had let us not dwell on it. One or two flares. What a lot of silvery tubes. A very post-priestly industrial landscape. Post-Lowry too. Post-humanity like robots intestines. Aluminium tubes in the distance. The sky had a doom watch power. We drive on. And so to Stockton on Tees. In Stockton, said Priestley, English people are in a dreadful plight. As a thriving industrial town, its life has been pitifully brief, he said. Grass-grown shipyards, workshops with grimy broken windows, middle-aged men who look like old men and grey-faced women who remember new clothes, good meals, holidays and fun, as if they had once lived in another and better world. But it wasn't only... Priestley who saw the shocking unemployment in Stockton. Harold Macmillan was MP for the town and Stockton the constituency shaped Macmillan, made him pledge his post-war Tories to peace and prosperity. There must be a plan. And in recessions and slumps since Macmillan, in the governments of Douglas Hume, Wilson, Heath and Callaghan, they've all tried to cushion the worst effects of unemployment and deliberately introduce new work in the worst places. So like the vast post office savings bank was moved to Glasgow, the newfangled gyro to Bootle, the vehicle licensing to Swansea, to Teesside to Stockton has come the last quango. In April of 82, for the 808 vacancies, we had something like 900 applications which shows you the extent of the unemployment both in the Stockton, Hartlepool and Teesside area. I mean, they ranged from 
unemployed teachers, librarians, redundant executives, way down to school leavers, waitresses. That was phenomenal. Ah, Stockton, in this most dog-eared corner of England, we'd stopped our little car by a 1960s office block and up in a lift speedy to the fourth floor. Downstairs we have the unemployment benefit and then on the next floor we have the official receiver and the income tax office. We did have a firm called John Lappins upstairs who did engineering in the oil industry and they've just gone into liquidation. So that floor is now empty. The floor between the dole and bankruptcy is the latest quango of the 1980s, the only one Mrs Thatcher's let get through, the public lending right, whose idea is, with about £2 million a year of public money, to pay writers whose books are most borrowed from libraries at about a half penny per borrow. It's in Stockton that are stored 50,000 authors' bits, Little magnetic bits of my past. Who are they going to make with the VAT, the inland revenue, if I fill in a form to feed their machine? This office is big and airy, open plan, and everyone uses the same lavatory, except the computer that, of course, has a room of its own. And VDUs, visual display units, they press the keyboard and up I pop on the screen. This is based on the British National Bibliography. Good God, that goes back before I want to remember. Well, this is a book by Ray Gosling, and it's the title is Personal Copy, a memoir of the 60s, and it's produced in London by Faber in 1980. And these num each of these numbers represents a library, and this means that all these libraries have a copy of your book. Mm. There's no way that you can give information like that to anybody else, like... In contact. Well, um, no, or... <laughs> no, but anyone who has, who um, lives in the southeastern region, has access to these records and can find out that way. Too many bits of my past. Everything written and bought by a public library is listed. So if I joined the five thousand authors who have already registered, I wondered, couldn't I press gang? couple of maiden aunts offer a job to a gang of grannies off the Old Age Opportunities Commission to nip in and out of the selected libraries in the scheme. In and out, in and out, for they only check ten libraries in England. Their computers compute from that. I put all this into the lap of Assistant Registrar Stoko. We have raised this um, at each library that we've been to and librarians are wide awake and they would almost certainly, we've been assured, spot the maiden aunt nipping in and out of a particular library three and four times in an afternoon. As well as that, the computer system that we use to analyse the loans from the libraries does in fact have um, an inherent check and we have agreed with the various um, bodies concerned that we set an upper limit on loans of a particular book from any particular library and if, if indeed there was um, any concerted attempt to to fiddle, as you put it, then we would have this um, brought to our attention by the computer system. But authors wouldn't be hauled all the way to Stockton? Well, there are quite severe penalties um, ingrained within the Act. What are the penalties? Um, penalty, I think, is uh, a £1,000 fine. So I bet they're running a programme of fiddler deterrence on their computers already. FD, they say to their VDUs, 27 people looking like J.B. Priestley descending on Beckenham Library, asking for literature and Western man. Investigate, investigate. Or Melvin Bragg, Gateshead, Formby and Hendon, all reporting a mass raid on Speak for England. Confidence high. Stockton on T's PLR to all centres. A mass raid. Confidence high. <laughs> From the tees to the tyne takes our little car an hour on broad dual carriageway roads. Undulating country, hedges, cereal farms and the occasional pit heap grown over and green. On our left in the distance, Durham Cathedral. Undulating country like East Kent or North Knotts. 
But when Priestley came in 1933, East Durham made the most startling chapter of his book. The hell holes he described. Approaching Newcastle, there was, he says, a nightmare place, constructed of small army huts and unwanted dog kennels. Even a kaffer wouldn't have envied the employees who lived in these forlorn shanties. Picture palaces with hardly a flake of paint, butchers' windows decorated with offal. But I saw none of that. We crossed the green banks of the Tyne, where, if the salmon haven't returned, I'll eat my hat. An old Newcastle, its public buildings scrubbed clean to golden stone, new Newcastle bathed in purple floodlight. Canary yellow buses, and yellow metro trains with shiny new stations quite free of graffiti. Progress with a capital P, a worthy and just tribute to past years of socialist politics. How Jack Priestley would rejoice to see it. He was always in the book calling for a plan, a big plan, to right the wrongs of England. And now, well, it's council house estates rather than the Kappa's shanty. The welfare state, pensions for all and social security. I went to Long Benton, an extremely boring suburb on the eastern fringes of Newcastle. Long Benton is famous for housing just about the biggest institution now affecting almost all of us in England, the DHSS. And I was met at the gate as Priestley was on his visits to factories by their public relations man, person, I should now say, John Garfit. Uh, what you see, the three-storey building in front of you, a bit like an iceberg, it's the tip of the whole office complex. You're actually seeing a tenth of it. Behind it is about a million square foot of office accommodation. You're really talking about the largest social security office in the United Kingdom, probably the biggest office complex in the Western Hemisphere apart from places like the Pentagon in America, and certainly the largest computer installation in Europe. And what does it do? What's the purpose of it? First and foremost, it looks after the national insurance records for the whole of the working population of the United Kingdom. We pay pensions to about 10 million pensioners for the whole of the United Kingdom from this side. But why did it come so big and so central here in Newcastle? Originally it was set up shortly after the war to employ the people coming back from the war when they knew that they might have a, an unemployment situation in this locality. This is one way in which it was felt politically that they could help matters. And today the biggest employer on Tyneside is the DHSS. How right and fitting the North East should be headquarters for this technology. Cited by a Labour government remembering the crusades that began at Jarrow on the Tyne. John Garfit took me into his warren. This is a very sort of 1946 building, isn't it? It's a typical temporary building put up in the war. Build up. It was first built as a temporary structure during the war, and you'll find that there's lots of similar offices throughout the country. Single story, flat roofed. Really, they were built originally, for, I think, for hospital purposes. But now, how big the site? They've got the longest corridor in the world, restaurants, cafeterias, three banks, an on site hairdresser. How caring the welfare industry, and acres and acres of girls. Acres of girls all rubbing their legs together, no, not really, all sitting in front of the VDU, when up came a suited man. Taking data taken from claim forms, for instance, a form PATB, which is completed by a pensioner at a post office, notifying a change of address or and a change of post office. They are keying the data in thus transforming it into a machine-readable format which can be read by the, accepted by the mainframe computer downstairs. And how long do they sit tapping away before they get a break? They are entitled to a monotony break of five minutes in every hour. But they prefer to have the monotony breaks 
added on to the tea break and thus make the tea break a longer period away from the machine. 14,000 key depressions an hour is their average. Some do 20,000 an hour. VDU depression. I thought remembering what Priestley said when he went to the Woolsey Sock Factory in Leicester. The places have the controlled orderliness of a beehive or an ant hill. They're not bullied, but between the time they clock in and clock out, their central human dignity has no real existence except in that dream of life which occupies their minds as their fingers flip to do their little task. They don't have to think about it. In fact, if they think about it, they're not being efficient. Because it's got to be totally instinctive. That what the eye sees, they key in. They ain't got to think about it. They haven't got to know what they're keying in. It's just got to go, ju 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 It's like a machine process. And they can be thinking, now, do you want steak and kidney tonight? I'm sure that a nice steak. Uh, I wonder what I should do for my boyfriend at night. What pay size do I have? Those kind of things. That's what they're really thinking about. And so to the heart, a huge, cold, white room with banks and banks and banks of computers like home freezers. And on to where printers are printing and pouring out pension books, gyro and welfare by the ton. How Beveridge would rejoice. We're producing the equivalent of cash. And the amount we produce on central office each day is more than the Bank of England produces. I don't believe that. I mean, how much is it in terms of millions well, we're of pounds? Talk we're talking in pension terms of every year producing about £14,000 million pounds worth of pension orders. The servant of the computer. It works all night, every night does what's called an update and produces the kind of information we want. When it's ready? Yes, when it's ready. When it's ready. Were you here before the computer came? I wasn't, but I worked in local offices. And you'll understand then that the whole thing was based on ledger sheets, a whole story of a person's life on a piece of paper in a big binder, thousands of them all along the walls. And a clerk would go along, look up the binder and find when the person was in New Zealand, when the person was born, etc. Now the computer knows all that. And then for the second time on this journey into the northeast England, I wanted to check what they knew about me. Rosalind's called across to depress the keys at the VDU. And there I'm told how many people on these records? 40 million. <laughs> Now I'm through to the computer. The NI index. Well, put my name on. Do you have a second? Yeah. Uh, yes, I do, Arthur. Do you have, do you have a date sure of birth? Put, yes, I do. <laughs> five five thirty nine. I'm not sure all these Sorry. people should be standing round actually because I've something. I think it's just between me and you, Ros. This. <laughs> There's no trace for you. No trace for this inquiry. What does that mean? National insurance. Isn't <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm actually, I'm actually two years owing. Uh, I'm behind on my national insurance things. Ah, it's come up with my address. That's rather good. Yes, it's come up with my address and the fact that I'm male. All right, now that's 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 me dealt with. Now, what happens if? Um, Let's see if we can find out the, the number for uh, J.B. Priestley. Oh, you can't. Why can't you? Because, in fact, all our information is confidential. And there's no way we would allow someone to come along and actually go into the system to find out information which they weren't authorised to obtain. Oh, dear. What happens if it's Chief Constable Big Potts? We would tell the Chief Constable that our information is confidential. But there may be certain exceptional circumstances when it may be in the interests of the public to divulge limited information from our records, but it would be a totally exceptional circumstance. John Garfit did admit that helped in the hunt for the Yorkshire Ripper, but security is supposed to be as tight as Filingdale's, and like Filingdale's, 
they've got little gatehouse at the main entrance. There is a human face sitting in a porter cabin, a sort of Dixon of Doc Green of this Pentagon of Social Security. This is our little inquiry office. Good morning, sir. Morning. Good morning. This is Bill Green. This is our man at the gate. So many people turn up to this central office to ask Bill Green, what about my pension? Gimme, gimme, I paid my contributions, gimme my gyro. I had one person here from Norfolk Island, which is a small island in the South Pacific. I'd never heard of it. The person involved who came here had worked for a while in this country before he'd went to live there, you see, and he thought he may have some sort of pension entitlement. Where's the furthest anyone's come I once had a, a Polish gentleman here who had escaped from the Siberian salt mines during the war and he'd met up with the British in the Middle East and he joined up. And he had, he'd come here over a pension query, believe it or not, because he had worked in this country for the forces, you see. <laughs> Did you ever get famous people? Stars? Yes, to... yes, famous people, yes. I had a lady who was Lady Churchill's secretary who came here a few years ago to uh, sort out Lady Churchill's actual entitlement to retirement pension. Newcastle's a very cosmopolitan place. Have you ever had any of those Yemenis? Oh, yes. You see, um, for instance, yesterday, I had three Yemenis who were going to go back, seeing they'd got their pensions, they were going to go back to reside in their home country of North Yemen, you see. Now, the strange thing is that Whilst they have wives in the North Yemen, their wives have never, ever lived in this country. But they will be getting a pension from this country because their husbands' contributions have qualified them for this, you see. They had such a rush when British Rail once had a senior citizen go anywhere for a pound day. Hordes of the old from Torquay banging on Bill Green's porter cabin. Are my contributions safe? Sometimes they write, like a very rich man living in Monaco, so pleased with his regular gyro, he sent to Newcastle as a present a Harrods Wedgwood Blue bathroom suite. The DHSS kept it, but raffled it, of course, for charity. Back in Newcastle, the clock struck on the new city hall. And as we went through Newcastle, heading for the Roman road west, I noticed two things. The first was Armstrong's new tank factory on the Scotswood Road, rebuilt in 1982 as the biggest tank works in the world. The largest number of acres of factory now beneath one roof in England. For war, we are rearming. And on the road out, a brand new Saracen tank on a lorry being taken somewhere, with thousands and thousands of workers on defence contracts. If we weren't arming ourselves to the teeth, how many more would be supported by the DHSS? How can we stop? Priestley always said, you must have a plan. Nobody had one in 1933. No likely body has one in 1983. Making for the Roman road, straight as a die, by Corbridge House of Catherine Cookson, by Hexham Abbey in darkish mood, clouds in the sky, halt whistle and to the right over there, just over the Roman wall is Spidadam, a thicket of woods on the roof of England, a dark blotch on the evening landscape. In there, Spidadam, was where we were going to launch British rockets to the moon, seriously began with blue streak and black arrow and ended when the weather just not enough sunny days. Just think, if the weather had been different up there, future Roy Kinnett government would be launching for peaceful purposes, peaceful rockets, SS Michael Foote, naming them like British Rail their engines, spaceships Bessie Braddock, the Lord Beveridge, Ken Livingstone GLC to be tracked by Filingdales, Lord Peter Townsend, Jeremy Seabrook, B.A., 
J.B. Priestley O.M.